We all know the dinosaurs went out with a bang. A big meteor the size of Mount Everest crashing into Mexico. But fewer know that they began with a storm. Not a hurricane, not a flood season, but rain that fell for nearly two million years. Born from an eruption that turned deserts into swamps and rewrote the rules of life on Earth. It begins with fire. Off the coast of what is now British Columbia, the Earth splits open, lava fountains into the sky, red rivers tearing across a supercontinent so vast you could walk from one pole to the other and never touch an ocean. This is Pangaea, 234 million years ago, and it is about to be drenched in something no creature alive has ever known. The Rangelia Large Igneous Province isn't subtle. For nearly a million years it bleeds basalt, the kind of eruption that, in other chapters of history, spelled extinction. The Siberian traps had wiped out 90% of life just a few million years before. The Deacon traps, much later, would help fell the dinosaurs themselves. Fire usually means death. But here, something strange happens. As gases pour from the cracks, carbon dioxide, sulfur, methane, the skies shift. CO2 climbs past a thousand parts per million. The greenhouse slams shut. The air grows hotter, heavier, swollen with moisture. And then, over a desert world that had been dry for hundreds of millions of years, it starts to rain. Not for a season, not for a century, but for nearly two million years. Imagine the sound, forests erupting in places where once there was sand. Rivers carving new veins into bedrock, monsoons pounding the heart of a continent so wide that no cloud had touched it in ages. For the creatures of the Triassic, this is no gentle shower. Acid falls from the sky, seas turn sour, reefs bleaching into nothing. 30% of marine species vanish. The air is a cocktail of ash and water. And yet, the world does not end. It changes. Because in this deluge, new ecosystems will rise, old rulers will fall, and a group of scrawny reptiles, a little more than evolutionary understudies, will find themselves walking suddenly onto the center stage. This is the story of the Carnian Pluvial Episode, the million year storm that didn't destroy life, but rewrote it. In Earth's history, most great volcanic events meant mass extinctions. 252 million years ago, the Siberian traps drowned an area the size of Europe under 3 million cubic kilometers of lava. Atmospheric carbon dioxide rose to over 4,000 parts per million. To put that into context, anywhere near 2,000 ppm is considered critical for your health. But that's not all. Global heat spiked by 8 to 10 degrees centigrade, and the oceans turned anoxic. 90% of marine species and 70% of land vertebrates perished. As geologist Robert Richau summarized in Earth Science Reviews, the climate impact was catastrophic. 66 million years ago, the Deccan Traps in India erupted in pulses that spread 1 million cubic kilometers of basalt across the subcontinent. Combined with a Shikslub asteroid impact, the event killed off all non-avian dinosaurs, clearing the way for mammals to develop. Stephen Self and colleagues wrote in Science that Deccan volcanism was a critical component of the end Cretaceous crisis. By that measure, Rangelia, a large igneous province that surfaced across what is now British Columbia and Alaska, should have been another tombstone. Between 234 and 232 million years ago, it released an estimated 1 million to 2 million cubic kilometers of basalt. Over its lifetime, more than 5,000 gigatons of CO2 entered the atmosphere. The consequences were sharp. Extinctions followed suits, including continents and reef builders. Coral ecosystems collapsed. On land, acid rain scarred soils and reshaped flora. Fossil pollen indicates a major turnover of vegetation. As Kai Cheng Yang and his team noted in Science Adventures, the Carnian pluvial episode marks a major floristic turnover, with the first appearance of amber producing conifers. But despite all this, unlike the Siberian or Deccan traps, Rangelia did not tip Earth over the brink. Instead of 90% extinction, the toll was closer to 30%. Instead of 10 degrees of heating, there were 4 degrees centigrade. The ecosystems buckled, but they did not collapse beyond repair. Think of it as a controlled burn. The old canopy was stripped away, but the soil was left fertile. Niches lay empty, sunlight reached the ground, and into this space, 
new lineages began to move. For ammonoids, crinoids and corals, Rangelia meant extinction. For dinosaurs waiting in the wings, it was their first invitation to take the stage. Before Rangelia tore the sky open, Pangaea was a desert world. At its centre stretched endless dune fields and salt flats, landscapes where rain rarely fell and rivers often died before reaching the sea. Fossil pollen and sediments show vast arid belts cutting across the supercontinent, broken only by seasonal rivers along the coasts. For tens of millions of years, life had adapted to drought. Then the eruptions began. When carbon dioxide shot past 1,200 ppm, nearly five times today's level, global temperatures climbed by 3 to 4 degrees centigrade. That rise was enough to supercharge the planet's water cycle, because with every degree of warming, the air can hold roughly 7% more water vapour. With 4 degrees added heat, the skies over Pangaea suddenly carried almost 30% more moisture than before. Monsoons flooded the interior, red deserts turned into wetlands, rivers expanded into mile-wide floodplains. Across what is now northern Italy, the Dolomites preserve thick mudstones and sandstones laid down by these new torrents. In South China, palisols transformed into kaolinite clays, their chemistry showing relentless leaching from weeks and months of rain. But this was by no means ordinary rain. Rangelia also belched sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, when these gases combined with water vapour, they oxidised into sulfuric acid. Clouds condensed around the droplets which fell to earth as acid rain, with a pH as low as 2 to 4, corrosive enough to etch carbonate rock and strip nutrients from soils. For a sense of scale, the most acidic rainfall ever measured in modern history came during the industrial smog crisis of the 1970s and 1980s where storms in Central Europe and the northeastern United States briefly plunged to pH 2.1 to 2.3, as if it rained lemon juice. In just a few decades, that rain stripped soils bare, killed fish in once clear lakes and withered the whole forests like Germany's Black Forest. It also harmed people. The same sulfur and nitrogen gases that formed the rain produced fine particles that drove tens of thousands of premature deaths each year from asthma, bronchitis and heart disease while acidified water supplies leached toxic metals into drinking water. That episode was temporary and regulations like the US Clean Air Act eventually curbed it. The Carnian pluvial episode delivered storms of similar acidity for nearly two million years. Limestone and dolomite dissolved, caves opened and surface waters turned acidic. What should have been life-giving rainfall became a chemical attack. The geological record shows at least four distinct wet phases within the Carnian pluvial episode, each separated by drier intervals. But each return of the monsoon was more violent than the last, as if the atmosphere itself was wound tighter and tighter by heat and gas before unleashing another flood. Deserts drowned and soils burned with acid, and the world's ecosystems were forced into reshaping under a sky that would not relent. And, as you've guessed, when it rains sulfuric acid, things don't go smoothly for the living. Storms scour the land, but not only. They also ran downhill, dragging their chemical scars into the oceans. Runoff from acid rain released torrents of dissolved calcium, magnesium and toxic metals. Rivers carried this cocktail straight into shallow seas. Geochemical profiles from Europe and China show sharp negative carbon isotope excursions signals of acidification and disruption in the carbon cycle. Sediments from the Dolomites reveal widespread black shales, the fingerprint of anoxic seas. In these layers, oxygen levels plummeted so low that entire food webs collapsed. Reef builders collapsed first. Triassic coral ecosystems, already fragile after the end Permian extinction, simply couldn't withstand waters that were both warmer and more acidic. Fossil reefs show a sharp decline in carbonate-secreting organisms. Corals, calcareous sponges and algae, leaving vast stretches of sea floor barren. Ammonoids followed, their once rich diversity dwindling to a fraction. Conodonts, the tiny eel-like creatures that had thrived for over 300 million years, were devastated. Rigo and colleagues writing in Nature Communications in 2020 estimated that one-third of marine species vanished, calling it a hidden mass extinction. Meanwhile, opportunists flourished. Microscopic dino flaglets exploded in abundance, their cysts suddenly filling the record. 
In Nature Communications, Massimo Rigo and colleagues described how the Carnian Pluvial episode marks a profound turnover in marine ecosystem, with a decline of continents and the rise of modern plankton groups. In other words, the crisis cleared the stage for lineages that still dominate oceans today. On land, the same pattern repeated. Fossil pollen records show forests reshuffling dramatically. Conifers adapted to wet. Acidic soils spread. Ferns proliferated in the wake of ecosystem collapse. Their spores often dominate strata immediately above crisis layers, a phenomenon paleobotanists call a fern spike. As Kai Cheng Yang's team noted in Science Advances in 2020, the Carnian rains marked a major floristic turnover, one that reshaped terrestrial ecosystems and introduced new lineages. What began with lava and rain now spread into every corner of Earth's system. Atmosphere, soil, river, and reef. So the CPE was not a clean slate, it was an edit. Species finally turned to stability. Reef, corals, ammonoids, conodonts lost their footing. Generalists, fast producers, and opportunists filled the vacuum. And in that balance, the stage was set for one group of small bipedal reptiles to turn crisis into opportunity. Before the rains, dinosaurs were little more than evolutionary footnotes. In South America's Ischigolasto formation, dated to about 231 million years ago, skeletons of early dinosaurs like Herrerasaurus ischigolastenesis and the small herbivore Pisanosaurus merti appear among far more abundant archosaurs and synapsids. Analysis of the fauna showed that dinosaurs made up less than 10 to 15% of individuals, the rest dominated by large Rorosicians, Cynodonts, and Rhynchosaurs. But the carnial pluvial episode really cleared off the stage for them. As monsoons transformed arid basins into humid floodplains, new ecosystems opened up. In places like the Santa Maria Formation in Brazil, species such as Storicosaurus pressia and Soteronelia tupiniquim diversified rapidly, filling niches left vacant by collapsing herbivore guilds. By the time the rains had cycled through, dinosaur remains were no longer rare intrusions. They were common finds across wide geographic ranges. The most dramatic signal comes not from the bones, but from footprints. Track sites in the Southern Alps, the Germanic Basin, and Argentina show that during the Carnian Norian transition, dinosaur track abundance exploded. At some localities in the Dolomites of Italy, dinosaur tracks rise to over 90% of all recorded ichnofauna. Within just a few million years, what had been a scattered presence turned into dominance, written directly into the layers of Triassic mud. And it wasn't just theropods. Early sauropodomorphs, precursors of the giant long-necked dinosaur, appeared during the same interval. Fossils of Platosaurus engelhati, found in Norian deposits of Germany and France, represent some of the earliest large-bodied herbivores to exploit the wetter landscapes made possible by the Carnian rains. Their presence marks a shift. Dinosaurs were no longer fringe survivors. They were building ecological empires. Paleontologist Massimo Bernardi summarized it in Nature Communications in 2018. The Carnian pluvial episode marks the first major diversification of dinosaurs, coinciding with a dramatic increase in their footprint abundance across Pangaea. When the skies finally eased, Pangaea was no longer the same continent. Where once a red desert stretched without end, floodplains now glittered with rivers that never dried. Vast forests of conifers and ginkophytes rose above carpets of ferns, their roots locking carbon into their mats of peat. Over time, these swamps pressed down into the coral seams once mined in Europe during the 20th century, the black strata born from two million years of relentless rain. In this greener world, the animals changed with the land. Herds of Plesiosaurus, some stretching 10 meters long, trampled through fern prairies in what is now Germany. Their footprints pressed deep into the wet clay, show lines of animals moving together, feeding on cycads and seed ferns that had spread into the open spaces. Predators stalked the edge of these herds. Lith theropods like Coelphesis, barely three meters long but swift, hunting in the tanged floodplain thickets. The air was different too. With carbon dioxide drawn down from its Carnian peak of 1,200 ppm, the climate stabilized into something more temperate. Rain still fell, but not with the corrosive acidity that had scarred the land before. Lakes grew clear again. The soils, once stripped bare, now carried rich layers of humus, alive with fungi and insects. 
This was not a return to the old Triassic order, this was a new world entirely. Gone were the reef builders that once structured shallow seas, ammonoids that had dominated open waters, the crinoids that carpeted ocean floors. On land, the once abundant rinchosaurs and dagnodonts dwindled into obscurity. In their place, dinosaurs spread into every niche that rains had opened. The Carnian storm had ended, but it left behind a landscape remade. Humid floodplains, deep coral swamps, forests rising where deserts had been. And at the center of it all, dinosaurs now moved as if the continent belonged to them, which it would for the next 150 million years. Oddly, it began with fire. Off the coast of what is now British Columbia, the Earth split open 234 million years ago. Pangaea would never be the same again. Lava fountains into the sky, red rivers tearing across the subcontinent so fast you could walk from one pole to the other and never touch an ocean. The Rangelia eruptions bleed basalt for nearly a million years. Gases pour from the cracks. Carbon dioxide, sulfur, methane. The air grows hotter, heavier, swollen with moisture. And then, over deserts that have been dry for hundreds of millions of years, acidic rains start to pour for nearly two million years. When it stopped, forests, wetlands and floodplains have replaced the deserts and drylands. Ecosystems collapse and rebuild. And, as often, cards were massively redistributed. Dinosaurs would be the new kings of the land, only to meet a similar, if not worse, fate. If you found this story as strange and interesting as I did, let me know what you think. Would you have survived 2 million years of acid rain or vanished with the reefs and the ammonoids? Share your answer in the comments and if you want more forgotten turning points of prehistory, make sure to subscribe. Until next time, keep listening to the Echoes.